Well, welcome. Um, I gave this talk last year, and at that time we talked about a few uh, proposals, and so we thought we'd come in and do that again. So I'm Mike Allison. If you go to the website, it says I work for a different company. I actually work for Samsung. I'm a senior director focusing on standards. And I'm here. So in the last year, since FMS last year, we ratified 25 technical proposals, and we had six ECNs that were done. And I do want to talk about what does it mean we have all these ratified technical proposals. Um, from an NVMe perspective, we have the NVMe 2.0 family specifications, and then we have all these technical proposals. They're all released. However, each technical proposal is a separate document altogether. So if you're working on anything, all from my point of view as part of the membership, that's still all part of one document. When the next release gets done, we take all those documents and we put them in one set of specs again, and we put them all together. So from a perspective of my point of view, it's all part of the NVMe specification. And once they're released, then go out and build what you need to build, and it's all going forward from that point of view. And I picked just a handful of proposals to go over. I wanted to talk about some real issues of what kinds of things come into NVMe to uh, standardize, and I wanted to give a, a, a go over all the different technologies that we cover in NVMe. So one of the things is, is we found out that all these devices out there were providing signal integrity measurements for PCIe lanes, but they were all doing it uniquely. And the customers came in and said, can we have one way to kick off it, kick it off? Can we have one way to know how long it's going to take? Can we um, understand that if we kick it off, what's the progress of it? And then finally, can we get results? Okay. And when we get results there, we did all this through a single log page. And when you get the results, there are two specific um, information that comes back. One is, is the data, this very specific data about the signal integrity is still vendor specific. And so we allow the log page to return that data and that can still be vendor specific because we couldn't standardize that. But we're also allowing an optional, hey, what does my eye look like or my eyes when you get into the later versions of PCIe? So there can be options that says, yeah, you got, got a simple printable eye with ones and zeros and a bit ma ma uh, map there that you can actually see them, which hey, if I'm having a problem on my server and I think it's signal integrity, you can run this and do this. Now, what's unique about this is, is given the family of specifications, is this log page is actually going to be in the PCIe transport specification because this is very specific to a transport. You're not going to see it in the base spec. You're not going to see it in IO command set. So by spreading it out and focusing it on the exact actual transport that's there, and if other transports come in and they need the same capability, we would add the capability there as we go forward. So the other one is, uh, we realized that if you're debugging drives and you're now doing the NVMe 2.0 family specifications and somebody says, I have this problem, they'll say, well, what versions are you running? Well, we realized that we only had the base specification version in there. We didn't have the IO command set versions in there because they're allowed to run un uh, uniquely. We don't tie them to together. They may tie together, but they also may have different version items. So we went ahead and updated the log pages to also specify the, the various uh, flavors of versions that could be there. Um, just is, you can't run an NVMe device without supporting multiple of the specifications that are out there. So one of the ones is if you look at zone namespaces, you actually have to implement three of the specifications because zone namespaces builds on the NVM command set and they all build on top of the base specifications. So you would need all three of them. So we came up with a way for each IO command set to provide their versions so we from an understanding of a debugging capability. And then there's flexible data placement. You're going to see a lot of uh, presentations here on it today. Last year we gave a presentation, but we were very vague because we were still defining it. We were arguing over, should we call it this name or that name? And we were very vague on the terms. Well, now it's ratified. It got ratified, uh, I remember the date, uh, December 12th, 2022. <laughs> um, and it essentially is a scalable way to allow a host to say, when a write comes in to the host, I want to specify a specific reclaim unit handle, a write resource, and target it to a particular reclaim group and write it to a reclaim unit. 
So now what hosts have the ability to do is say, I want to write this set of data into one set of physical memory, and I want to manage it as a chunk. I can erase it as a chunk. And if they erase it before the controller has to move it due to internal things that will happen that you could learn about later, um, then, gar then there's no copy part of the garbage collection, and there's just the erase, and that's where you get the right amplification improvement. One of the other things about FDP is it's fully backwards compatible. I can take a drive that's enabled at FDP. I can unplug it from a server that understands FDP. I can go to a server that doesn't know about FDP and plug it in, and it just works. And in fact, it behaves exactly the same as a drive that doesn't do FDP. And what happens there is they all use the same reclaim unit. All writes go through the same buffering. We mix the data, and we write it to the NAND backend. So it's fully backwards compatible. And what that gives the host is the ability is when I want to modify my software to use FDP, I can choose when I do it. I don't have to modify my software first before I enable FDP. In fact, you can buy FDP drives, enable them, use them a conventional way, and then at some later time you say, I want to start moving it, start changing your software. You don't even have to reconfigure the drive to take advantage of FDP. And if you come to my presentation tomorrow, I'll tell you a little more about how it works. I got all these animations to show you how the commands work, and it's pretty cool. <laughs> all right, let's go to manageability side. Um, NVMe 2.0 added this new thing called the NVM subsystem shutdown. And what that was is before that came in, each controller, if you had like a dual port SSD, each controller could come in and say, I want to shut down, I'm going to power off. And then this other controller could say, I want to power off and shut down. From the controller point of view, I have two controllers, but I have one NAND backend dealing with the I.O. there. And if one says shut down and the other one doesn't say shut down, I don't shut down the media because I still have an active controller. Okay? Part of shutdown is I'm going to power down, but they could shut down and then restart and never power off. And so NVM subsystem shutdown came in and said, well, look, if, if I got a dual port and I have two PCIe links and one of the PCIe links broke, I can't shut down one of the controllers. I can tell the other controller to shut down, but now if I really do a power cycle, we're going to have an unsafe shutdown and the next power up is going to take a long time. So we added the NVM subsystem shutdown. Now that led us to another problem. When you're looking at manageability, which is a sideband communication to look in there, and they don't understand that shutdowns occurring in the whole system, and we do shut down all the controllers, and so we shut down the media, get ready for power off, and they come in and said, I want to do an important admin command, and I come in, and the device says, no, nope, I can't do your command because the media is shut down. And they said, no, I really need you to do the command, independent of, the, of what happened, what we call in-band versus out-of-band. Uh, out and so what we're doing is this TP allows the device to say, I know I told the in-band host to shut down when they requested it, but I'm going to bring media back up. I'm going to satisfy the out-of-band communication. I'm going to give them their answer, and then I have the ability to shut it back down again. So if power does go away, I come back up in a nice orderly fashion when I come up. So this way, sometimes in out-of-band, they really want their answer independent of what the hosts are doing on the other side because they're trying to make a higher level decision about what to do. And then another one on NVMe over fabrics was um, done a lot with security. I could have picked a whole bunch of TPs to do, but I thought this one was kind of fun to think about. So when a host is connecting to an NVMe over fabrics controller, you can do an authentication. And part of the authentication is doing a DH Mac chap authentication sequence. And what happens is the host comes down to the controller and says, I want to connect and we want to do this authentication. And so then the NVMe host has to say, well, I need to verify that you can talk to me. Okay. And to do that, I need to have a security key about you already in me so I can prove that I can talk to you. And then it would do its computation and return back to the host and says, yeah, you can talk to me. Can I talk to you? And they would do the same thing. And they both do a, a DH Mac chat. Well, what we did is we now can have an independent entity that does that DH, uh, HMAC chap authentication. And so now the NVMe over fabrics nor the host need to do that. What they can say is the host comes in to the controller and he says, I want to talk to you with authentication. And then NVMe over fabrics controller can go over to this authentication device and say, can I talk to him? And then if the answer is yes, he says, yeah, I can talk to you. And then the host comes in and goes to that same thing as, can I talk to him? And they say yes. But what happens now is the security keys are in one entity. 
and it helps the administration to manage those security keys instead of distributing it to all the NVMe over fabrics controllers, which is getting complicated now because now we have virtualized NVMe controllers in the NVMe over fabric. So we're trying to help the administration in doing their administrations there. And to help when you look at a controller, now I only need one secret, I need the secret for this new AVE entity that we've defined. So with that, we have a lot of TPs that were done. We have and we have a lot of TPs we're working on. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to come up. I pretty much know every TP. Uh, I read them all. Um, work with my son to help get him integrated and, and whatnot. Um, and there's a lot of excitement going on, and we're not slowing down. It's getting busier and busier, and it is an exciting time. And the Errata Group, if you guys, um, I just want to say one thing about the Errata Group. Um, the people, the core people who are working on the specs, pride in generating a specification that can go out in the world and everybody can understand it. Part of the errata is if you guys have people that read a paragraph and say, I don't understand it, then we feel we didn't do our job. And so the bugzilla is to say, somebody read this and their understanding is this. Now, sometimes that understanding is you don't understand the spec enough and we can go through that. But sometimes people read it differently and we'll look at it and go, I can see how they can read it. And so then our job is to perfect the clarification because we want to be able to give this to any engineer. They can go implement a device and we can keep the ecosystem going. So that's the end of my presentation. Is there any questions?